Welcome to the Human Experience Podcast, the only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet. As we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are the Intimate Strangers. Thank you for listening. What's up, guys? This is a phenomenal conversation with Dr. Rick Strassman, the author of DMT, The Spirit Molecule. In it, we get into some of the cultural ramifications of the usage of DMT. We talk about the stigma behind the usage of this compound. You will enjoy this episode. It was our second time with Dr. Strassman on the show, so we thoroughly enjoyed his presence. Please pick up a copy of his book, DMT, The Spirit Molecule, and DMT, The Soul of Prophecy. Also, get to us on Facebook and Twitter. You can do that at The Human XP. Thank you guys so much for listening. If you like what we're doing, get to our support us page, thehumanxp.com slash donate, and show us your support. Thanks, guys, so much. You will enjoy this episode. The human experience is activating the DMT in your brain as we speak to our guest, Dr. Rick Strassman. Dr. Strassman, welcome back to HXP, sir. It's a pleasure. Well, thanks. Uh, It's nice to be on your show. So, Dr. Strassman, I think think the last time that we spoke was actually exactly a year from now. We, We spoke in June of 2015, and we covered your second book, uh, Soul of Prophecy. I mean, in the last year, what would you say, in a in a cultural regard, how, and I'm I'm diving right in here, but what would you say in a cultural regard? How do you think the perception of DMT, DMT containing substances, ayahuasca? How do you think the perception of that has changed in mainstream culture? Well, I think when it comes to DMT within the scientific community, even you know pure DMT um, within the lay community, it's still sort of a sleeper, uh, you know, relative to ayahuasca in particular, and you know, relative to other drugs like you know psilocybin, which are getting a lot of airtime within the research community, um, and LSD is beginning to get some attention within the academic world as well. You know, DMT, there hasn't been a lot of, you know, new, of, uh, you know, new you know, scientific research with DMT. You know, there's a Hungarian group which is exploring the relationship between DMT and the uh, you know, sigma receptor, which is a unique receptor in the brain, but it's still kind of esoteric. Uh, you know, so, you know, people aren't you know, really, uh, you know, talking about, you know, DMT like they are, you know, the other drugs. Um, you know, that may change. Uh, a colleague, a junior colleague of mine, uh, a young guy from Britain who lives in Japan and is an, is an academic in Japan, um, he and I just, you know, published a uh, you know, paper that actually just came out today in its final form. And um, it is a model for the continuous infusion of pure DMT, uh, you know, to keep people in that state for an extended uh, period of time. And it's getting quite a few hits uh, on the journal in which it appeared, Frontiers in Pharmacology. Wow. You know, so that may stir the pot some with, you know, DMT. Um you know, ayahuasca is increasingly, you know, popular. Uh, you know, uh, you know, celebrities are, you know, taking it, talking about it. Uh, you know, Chelsea Handler, uh, you know, had an episode on ayahuasca on her show. Uh, so Lindsay Lohan also has been, you know, talking about her ayahuasca experiences uh, in a positive light too. Um, with respect uh, to my work, uh, it's been uh, kind of a lukewarm reception because of my attempt 
to bridge the world of the Hebrew Bible with the psychedelic worlds. Mm -hmm. uh, there's still, and probably will always continue to be a fair amount of friction uh, between those with an interest in uh, the psychedelic state and the psychedelic drugs. And the, uh, well, um, at least, you know, their view or their perspective or their understanding of uh, traditional Western religions like Judaism, which is the uh, the entity whose you know, sacred book, spiritual book, I've tried to relate to the DMT experience. But you, you, you kind of are known for breaking the door open on DMT research. I mean, you, you, you kind of bridged that that gap that people. I mean, people recognize your work as as revolutionary in in regards to DMT, the spirit molecule. I mean, that's that's kind of all I hear about when I hear about DMT. Right, um, and you know, my current work or the work I've been applying myself to for the last gosh, almost 20 years now, is to, you know, take the DMT story, uh, you know, further. Um, it kind of addresses the reason people take, you know, psychedelics. I mean, a lot of people take these drugs and want these kinds of experiences for enjoyment, for pleasure, uh, to increase their artistic or emotional appreciation of things. But uh, there will always be a fairly large minority of people that are interested in the spiritual properties of these drugs and the estates that they provide entrance to. And uh, um, my work kind of you know, takes it into uh, you know, the realm of the Hebrew Bible as opposed to the most you know, common religious, your metaphors or religious models, which are, you know, Buddhism and Latin American shamanism. I mean, why did you, if I can ask, why did you go there? I mean, why did you take it into this Judaism aspect? I mean, why, why, why go from, from DMT, the spirit molecule to DMT, the soul prophecy? Well, I kind of, you know, began the DMT work from a Buddhist spiritual model. I had been, you know, steeped in Zen practice and study for over 20 years, um, and I was expecting a particular type of religious or spiritual experience as a result of DMT administration consistent with the Buddhist Enlightenment experience, you know, Kensho or Satori, uh, and uh, that state is one of emptiness. Uh, there's no words, there's no you know, physical sensations. Uh, there's no content, there's no visions, there's no feelings, um, there's no concepts. Uh, there's a unification of one's personality or a, a obliteration or a merging or a you know, unification of one's individual personality with the ground of all being, which could be uh, you know, verbalized or expressed as the white light. Um, the, you know, expression in, uh, in uh, Buddhism is uh, emptiness or, you know, sunyata. Uh, you know, so those, you know, those were the kinds of experiences that both uh, myself and the volunteers were expecting. I mean, I came f or was coming, you know, from a Buddhist uh, background and most of my volunteers also had uh, some experience with Eastern religions, Eastern religious practices. Uh, but the state uh, which the high dose of DMT occasioned was anything, you know, but like the Enlightenment state. It was, you know, full of content, feelings, ideas. Uh, it was, uh, it, it was a, you know, densely populated world of light where, you know, people interacted with the you know contents that they encountered in that state, um, the personality was maintained. Um, there were interactions. Uh, you know, there were questions and answers. There was healing and harming, all kinds of things, which were really extremely at uh, you know ex extremely at you know the opposite end 
of what both the high and the volunteers were expecting. You know, so that was one reason uh, I started looking for other models. I'm I'm very curious about this. I mean, it seems very interesting because DMT has has such a profound difference between its its other other drugs. I mean, it and and as you said, I mean, there there seems to be a whole world, a whole a content world of 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 material of interaction of of something i mean just to i mean just to ask you directly do you do you believe that we could be maybe moving into an alternate dimension as we ingest this compound i think that's obviously the most important question or at least one of the most important questions that's raised by the dmt experience are the uh contents of the visions real uh, or are they just a hallucination Um, and I I just don't think we can uh, decide but I think we need to keep our minds open to any and all possibilities Um, you know when I concluded the first book on DMT the spirit molecule I proposed that perhaps DMT changed the receiving characteristics of the mind-brain complex and allowed us to perceive um, normally invisible worlds like dark matter or parallel universes. Um, You know, so it's conceivable that one could develop a camera, let's say, that could peer into dark matter, take pictures, and then compare perhaps the contents of dark matter with the contents of the DMT experience. But even if you know that were uh, you know possible, it's quite a long ways in the future, um, and it might explain the you know mechanisms you know by which we could perceive usually invisible worlds. But it wouldn't necessarily address you know some of the larger questions like why are things configured in this manner? You know why doesn't giving DMT make us grow an extra you know, nose or, you know, something like that. You know, so it you know, seems that the you know, presence of DMT in the human body as a naturally occurring compound and the effects of DMT seem to indicate uh, that there's a uh, you know, reason for DMT, you know, being in the human body, which is to, you know, provide access or a means of, you know, contacting these normally... Um, you know, imperceptible worlds, incomprehensible worlds. Hmm. You know, they could, you know, um, they could, you know, uh, uh, the experience or, you know, the content of that state could be, you know, simply a, you know, projection or a, you know, drug-induced hallucination. But that, you know, brings uh, me, you know, to one of the other, uh, you know, features of the DMT state that, you know, led me uh, towards looking at the Hebrew Bible as a good model. And uh, that is the unerring or the unshakable you know, sense of reality that people return with after experiencing a high dose of DMT. They, you know, feel as if the experience, what they perceived in that state was as real or more real than everyday reality. And the Buddhist model, uh, and even you know the other two models that I brought to bear, the uh, you know psychoanalytic and the you know, psychopharmacology models, all three of them propose the basic unreality uh, of the DMT world. So you know that was another reason uh, that uh, I wasn't quite you know satisfied with you know the Buddhist model. Y- 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 well, on the Latin American sh- shamanic model. You know, proposes you know the reality uh, of the of the worlds one encounters on ayahuasca, which contains DMT. But um, you know, there isn't really much of a you know moral you know background, which one could really uh, you know kind of rely on within Latin American shamanism. There's a connection. I mean, there's all of these states. I mean, if, if we're go, if we're meditating these out of body states, near death experiences, and I mean, can you clarify this for me? If 
I mean, is this true? The the myth that says um, that there is there's a sort of DMT release at the moment of death. Does I mean, have we measured that? Have we been able to analyze that? Is that real? Is that a true thing? No, it still is a. Uh, it's it you know it still occupies the position of an er- of of an urban myth, as it were. Uh, I, I, you know, I. I speculate in my, you know, DMT book that perhaps uh, the stress of the dying you know, process might, you know, be sufficient to increase the, uh, you know, natural production of DMT, but uh, we still don't know that. Um, I also speculate in the book that uh, the time of birth is also associated with, a, uh, you know, um, with. Um, with the increased production of DMT, you know, but we don't know that either. Uh, you know, there is a study uh, in Eastern Europe and Hungary which is being planned, you know, to look at concentrations of DMT in the blood of the fetus and of the umbilical cord at birth and the placenta. And, you know, to also look at the expression of the gene which is responsible or, yeah, well, um, well, the expression of the gene responsible for the enzyme that uh, makes DMT uh, in the placenta as well. Yeah, I think within a year or you know so, we will know you know some more about uh, if there is increased production of DMT at the time of birth. You know, there's a group in Ann Arbor, Michigan, as well, which is looking at you know DMT. Uh, in experimental death, you know, giving animals um, a, a, you know, killing stimulus, as it were. And, uh, you know, then, you know, looking at the presence of DMT in the brain. And, uh, you know, so far, those studies you know, haven't, uh, you know, come up with anything definitive yet. You know, but to the extent, you know, that the birth process or the, or, you know, the death, you know, process you know, shares any features with the DMT experience, it makes, you know, sense on that there's an underlying, you know, common process, you know, to the extent that they resemble each other. And it's interesting. It's, it really is truly interesting. The whole, the research that you've done and, and what's come out of it and, and more so, I think from a cultural regard to, you know, the, the people who are kind of, uh, ingesting this compound, coming back, and with these reports of meeting entities and 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 uh, encountering this, you know, this other space, this other dimensional space, it, it's it's fascinating. It's it truly it's remarkable that a this this compound exists, and b that it, it exists in naturally occurring in our bodies. So. I mean, the only thing that we're doing, drinking ayahuasca, is preventing the breakdown from it breaking down in our stomach while while we drink this tea, right? Well, it's a combination of you know factors, uh, it, you know, because ayahuasca, you know, contains DMT. Um, you know, if you just were you know taking the uh, inhibitors of DMT breakdown, it wouldn't you know, give you an ayahuasca experience. Um, it's the combination of the two plants. One contains DMT and the other um, <clears throat> will prevent its you know, breakdown in the gut and allow it to be orally active. It's, you know, like an oral DMT experience. Um, right. it is a, it's quite a bit slower, lasts longer. Um, one can work uh, with the experience to a lot greater extent that, than you can with the smoked or the injected form. Would you be able to put it on a scale? I mean, if, if there's if an ayahuasca experience is a four, then then smoking DMT maybe you know a seven or an eight, and then intravenously would be a ten. I mean, is there is there a, a variance in the type of experience that you have when you're when you're when you're ingesting it in different ways? I think that with DMT anyway, it's a pretty clear cut, you know, pharmacology. Uh, the amount in your blood determines the intensity of the effect. 
you know, so if you can, you know, get enough into your bloodstream through smoking, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, by way of the lungs uh, into the blood, you know, rather than directly into the blood, like injecting it. Um, I think the smoked and the injected intensity, you know, can be quite, you know, similar to each other. They can both get you, uh, you know, to a 10. And I, I, I think also, uh, even with, um, even with ayahuasca, uh, if you can attain the same levels in your blood of DMT, which would be attained with smoking or injecting it, you would have the, uh, a, uh, comparable level of intensity the you know, problem with uh you know drinking that much ayahuasca is uh the you know side effects from the mao inhibitors hmm. the you know, beta carbolines might just be too much uh you know to be able to reach those kinds of levels but but still you know i've heard or there's plenty of reports of people who drink dmt who describe experiences as intense as you know, fulsome as complicated articulated um comprehensive as anything one encounters with a smoked or injected form yeah you know i i really want to address the cultural stigma that is that is behind you know what what we're even talking about right now because i mean what is dmt scheduled as it's a schedule schedule one right so um obviously there is there is something happening here that that can we can learn from and from my understa- understanding of a schedule 1 substance there is there's no use or benef- beneficial use for a schedule 1 compound so i mean why do you think i mean there's we i mean there seems to be this vast spiritual learning that is that we're capable of th- by ingesting a compound and yet People are afraid because it's labeled a Schedule One because because the government has declared it illegal and people are afraid to talk about it. Um, I mean, when you know when I post this episode, it, it's going to be labeled a drug episode, and it just that that stigma, that cultural idea, bothers me. And why do you think why do you think that is occurring? Why do you think that our society is still plagued with this idea of of not being able to accept DMT as a resource? Yeah, you know, a few years ago, uh, there was a you know New York psychiatrist named Gerald Clerman who coined the phrase uh, you know, pharmacological Calvinism, um, and. Uh, you know, I think there is, uh, you know, some resistance against uh, or in response to experiencing pleasure uh, from drugs as opposed to experiencing pleasure from hard work or through religious grace uh, or through, you know, family life. Uh, you know, so the whole, you know, notion of, you know, pharmacological Calvinism is you only use, you know, drugs to cure illness. Uh, you don't use them to enhance wellness uh, or creativity or for spiritual benefits or even for experiencing pleasure. Uh, so I think it has to do, you know, something with the puritanical strain which exists in most, you know, societies. Um, I think also, you know, I, I also think that there are legitimate concerns uh, about keeping these, you know, drugs under, you know, some, you know, regulatory, uh, you know, short leash, as it were. Uh, you know, um, they can be abused and uh, they can be dangerous either in the wrong hands or taken by the wrong people. Um, you, you know, need to be pretty stable, healthy, uh, prepared you know, supervised and, you know, followed up. Um, If you're giving them, you need to know what you're doing. You know, so I think with the uh, burgeoning of, you know, clinical research, you know, human studies, which have taken place, you know, since, you know, my study began or was completed, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, know, well, well, that there is a, a, you know, rethinking uh, of the placement of these, uh, uh, you know, drugs into Schedule One. 
the three criteria for putting a drug into schedule number one is that it can't be used safely even under medical supervision and you know that's not turning out to be the case at all because of all of these uh, studies with these drugs for therapy and for understanding brain function and so on um, the other is that the uh, you know have got you know no known medical use uh, but that also you know doesn't really hold any water anymore because of all of the you know, positive studies that are coming out with respect to, you know, uh, the uh, you know treatment of OCD, uh, com- um, you know, the treatment of autism, post-traumatic stress, you know, substance abuse, alcoholism, tobacco abuse, uh, you know, depression, those kinds of things. You know, so the main criterion, which still remains, is that the drugs are highly abusable. You know, so the criteria, you know, two of the three criteria, you know, really aren't in effect anymore. So I think there's going to, you know, need to be, you know, the creation of a new schedule uh, as much as anything, which uh, acknowledges the abusability of these drugs, you know, and it acknowledges, uh, you know, that, you know, not everybody ought to be able to prescribe them. Uh, that you need to be trained, certified, supervised in administering them. And uh, you have to be, uh, you know, screened quite, you know, carefully if you're going to be taking them. And I, I don't think that, you know, necessarily is going to keep them in the hands of the elite, but it would at least provide some, it, it you know, would provide some oversight. And, you know, people are going to be taking whatever drugs they want in, you know, whatever circumstances, you know, that they feel like. But, um, you know, if you could conceive of a new schedule where these, uh, you know, drugs could be taken for any number of reasons, uh, for therapy, for spirituality, for creativity, um, in, you know, in uh, specialized, you know, centers, let's say, uh, with specially trained individuals, it would, uh, it would, you know, provide an option, uh, you know, for the use of these drugs in a, you know, wider arena you know, than is currently the case. And it's remarkable because at, you know, in any, in any corner, at any corner of any major city, you can find, you can buy alcohol, you can buy cigarettes, alcohol turns people into complete idiots. And it's just the most vile substance available. And yet it's readily available to anyone and everyone. And I, I mean, it, I just feel like the system is so completely backwards and we've been we've been so programmed and so stigmatized by the quote war on drugs which ha- in my opinion has been an abject failure and um, and just and and classifying people who who explore who decide that they wish to explore these compounds I mean let's take ayahuasca for example Um uh, the people that I know who drink ayahuasca have reported remarkable changes in their lives. They are completely different people by drinking this tea, this combination of this MAOI and DMT. And I mean, how is that? How is it possible that someone can realize that alcohol is a poison, that they can move into a healthy lifestyle, that they can change their work habits, that they can find new ideas? I mean, even even Albert Crick, the, the guy who um, visualized the, the DNA molecule, admittedly, he was, uh, he was microdosing LSD at the time that he visualized it, right? So... So, I mean, it's, it's just, it's astounding to me that we, all this legislation is in place and the system is, is designed to scare people away and, and so easily are, are people kind of labeled drug addicts, drug users. So, you know, outside of my rant, um, just you, there's, there's, what is the connection between the pineal gland and DMT? Um, well, you know, before we move into the pineal, you know, maybe uh, I could at least make my standard pitch for the value of of, um, of education uh, sure, to sure. change, you know, people's, you know, points of view, you know, like your show and, uh, 
you know, like what the, um, uh, you know, the advocacy organizations out there are doing, you know, CSP and MAPS and Hefter and the Beckley Foundation, you know, they're all uh, working, you know, hard to educate and also, you know, they're supporting research. You know, so if if you can educate people about these drugs and you could support research, which, you know, demonstrates that number, you know, that number one, they're safe and number two, you know, can be helpful in any number of, uh, you know, circumstances, then I think, you know, that the wheels will, uh, you know, gradually, you know, shift direction and uh, there'll be a more, um, you know, open-minded approach. Um, but still, I don't think, you know, wholesale use or, or you know, or a more um, widespread availability is especially going to be helpful. You, you know, marijuana, at least how it's, you know, normally used, um, is a mild intoxicant. So I think its widespread availability isn't going to cause the kinds of you know, problems that might occur if there were, for example, the widespread um, availability of LSD or DMT, where anybody could just you know go into a store, you know, demonstrate your legal age and buy it. Um, yeah, you know, so it's a you know nuanced uh, 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 you know situation uh, where you know case by case, you know, there are Schedule One drugs and there are Schedule One drugs. You know, there's heroin. There's marijuana, there's LSD, there's DMT. You know, those are all Schedule One drugs. But you know, well, and you know, K2 is a Schedule One drug. You know, so uh, I, I think one needs to be, uh, you know, discriminating and you know, looking at each case. Uh, well, so the pineal gland, yeah, um, it's a very interesting little organ in the middle of the brain, and I had speculated. A long time ago, gosh, you know, 30 years plus now, you know, that there was a, uh, you know, relationship between spiritual experiences which are, you know, felt to occur, you know, subjectively in the anatomical location of the pineal, you know, um, which is, uh, you know, just below the, uh, the, the, you know, fontanelle that, the, you know, soft spot which um, occurs in infants and then, you know, seals up as you grow, um, as you get older. Um, you know, that's always been uh, experienced as, you know, the location subjectively of, you know, the ultimate spiritual experience. And it's also the anatomic location of the pineal gland. You know, so I, um, you know, proposed a number of years ago that perhaps the pineal gland at certain times produced, you know, DMT, which would mediate uh, the, you know, psychedelic-like you know, properties of those spiritual experiences. And, you know, that had been speculated about um, within the context of the esoteric, you know, physiologies out there, like the chakras and Kabbalah, uh, the, you know, Sefi wrote. Um, yeah, you know, so it was a speculation which I included in my DMT book. And actually, about three years ago, uh, th um, you know, the research you know, group in Ann Arbor that I mentioned um, was able, you know, to, you know, um, uh, to determine that there, you know, was you know, DMT in the pineal gland of living rodents. Uh, you know, that's a paper that came out about three years ago now. Uh, you know, so it is the case that in certain, you know, situations, you know, DMT is produced in the pineal, you know, but that um, still, you know, shouldn't uh, overpower the, uh, you know, the, w w what's been known for quite a long time, you know, since the 50s almost or the early 60s is, you know, the DMT is, you know, made in the, in uh, the lung of uh, 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 well, of every mammal that, that's been investigated to date, uh, you know, so it you know could be you know that the lung is responsible for most of the DMT, which is you know circulating most of the time, and that the pineal may produce you know DMT only at uh, specific uh, you know at specific moments. Hmm, that's interesting. Uh, I, you know, there was it, it. It's interesting to me because. I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take this a little bit personal here. And, you know, there's, there's a, there's an organization, a uh, church that I belong to that uh, uses 
ayahuasca as its sacrament. I'm not going to drop its name. Either you know what I'm talking about or you don't. Um, I have had total 23 ayahuasca experiences. And um, in it, I've been drinking the tea for about two years. It's completely altered my being, who I am. It, I am a completely different person uh, in a positive way. I don't drink. I don't do drugs. I um, th- There's so many things, so many positive effects that I just... I, I, so what I, what I really want to kind of ask you about is the last, in the last, m- the most powerful experience that I've, I've ever had drinking the tea, um, there was, there was a point in which I, I encountered an intelligence it, and it was, I don't know how to describe it to you other than it was just the most profound, the most deep, I mean, in an ayahuasca experience, there's the ability to kind of move around so you can choose what you decide to look at and what you're not looking at. And when I, I, it felt as if I crossed this sort of barrier and the moment that I did, it was like, it was like, boom, there was, there was a, this sort of massive intelligence that just, and it just said, we are here. We've been here for thousands of years, for thousands of generations. We've, we've influenced your society. I mean, it, it was almost like having alien contact. And I know this sounds, this sounds re- absurd, but it was, it was the most powerful thing I've ever experienced. Is there any translation that you can kind of offer? Well, I think that's one of the advantages of the Hebrew Bible, to be honest. Um, It uh, describes things like that. Uh, It describes uh, a experience which feels as real or more real than anything else. Uh, It describes encounters with super powerful and intelligent beings who are usually invisible with whom we interact and who influence our lives and our world and history and biology in all manner of ways. Um, and it also establishes a, you know, a uh, you know, theological hierarchy and a moral scaffolding uh, that you can use in interacting with these beings, asking them questions, uh, understanding their answers, and then bringing back that information in a communicable way. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there was there was definitely an exchange of information, and um, I mean, I, I don't I don't want to get too deep into this just because it's, it's highly personal for me. But um, you know, there there was there was a there was a remarkable feeling or profoundness that I felt after the experience in which. I felt connected to all things and there was a beauty. There was a true sense of joy, just the, the wonder that I felt through that experience and the interconnectedness that I felt through just simply being alive, just simply being able to breathe air that, that, that renewed my sense of life, that renewed my sense of purpose And so, I mean, and, and if you look at, if you look at the state of ayahuasca tourism and the people, the people who are failing there, you know, there's Western medicine is failing to cure mental, these mental diseases. And, you know, which is why you see organizations like MAPS and um, the Hefner Institute and the Beckley Foundation, which are creating doors for us to, to move through so that we can heal PTSD and these, these psychological disorders that have plagued our Western culture, stigmatized society for generations now. Well, you know, you're speaking about, you know, the good effects of, you know, psychedelics in the, in this particular case, ayahuasca, you know, but I think it's important that one, you know, not gild the lily, as it were. Um, these, you know, drugs you know, can be misused by either people taking them or people giving them. Um, you know, Albert Hoffman was a Swiss German uh, who discovered or invented LSD, and one of his best friends was a German sol- or was a you know former German soldier who served in World War One, named Ernst Junger, 
who was a poster child for you know the Nazis and and even though he's passed away you know continues to be an inspiration for any number of you know neo-Nazi groups and you know Albert Hoffman and Ernst Younger used to take LSD together um, you know several times and uh, you, you know you kind of wonder what they thought about or talked about or you know hatched in the process um, and I've seen people become you know horribly sadistic and abusive uh, who take psychedelics um, and I've seen people, you know, give, you know, psychedelics to, uh, you know, mess with people. You know, so I, I think your experiences and, you know, those of the, you know, research, you know, subjects who are, are experiencing benefit, you know, they bespeak the importance of, you know, set and setting. Uh, the, you know, the intention uh, and the background uh, of the, you know, people taking the drugs and the you know, physical um, environment and, you know, the set of, you know, those giving them, you know, their, you know, desires and intents uh, for, uh, you know, you know, for giving, you know, the medications. Is it to heal or is it to harm? Is it for therapy? Um, is it to have, you know, sex with, you know, somebody? You know, so, um, you know, I like to think of these, you know, drugs as tools, and very strong tools, you know, like, you know, nuclear power uh, in a way, you know, it can, you know, produce electricity to, you know, power a hospital or it can, you know, blow up, you know, a big, you know, city and kill hundreds of thousands of people. You know, so I think, you know, these are, you know, very powerful drugs, which both can be extremely useful, but also can be, you know, just as destructive if, if they're if uh, they're misapplied yeah absolutely and i you know i really think you know i agree with you there there should be a cautionary note for you know anyone and i i have heard stories about these these people who are you know on on this sort of sexual conquest while you know they're they're handing out uh psychedelics which is it's just horrible um but essentially i think we the people who are studying these compounds and and truly believe in them, I think we are explorers. And I think essentially we are looking for answers. We we're trying to find, we're looking to answers of life's mystery. And I, I think the, one of the most intriguing compounds on the planet happens to be DMT. And, um, you know, there, there, there is this sort of sense of knowledge that that comes from from ingesting this this compound. Well, we clearly are more open to the you know, reception of you know novel information, you know novel perceptions. Uh, so, yeah, I think we need to be able to uh, you know determine to be able to to you know, tell if what we're learning, seeing, feeling is helpful or true uh, or not. You know, so I think it's good to have some benchmarks uh, that we can use in uh, determining, let's, you know, say the friendliness or the, you know, unfriendliness of the beings that we're encountering, uh, you know, the validity or the utility of what they're telling us or not telling us. Uh, so that's why I think it's good to have some benchmarks. And if we're looking at these drugs as aiding spiritual development, then it's good to have some spiritual benchmarks um, with which to kind of compare and contrast and judge, uh, you know, the merit of the things that we're being exposed to. And, you know, that could be Buddhism. It could be Judaism. It could be Islam. It could be Hinduism, you know, it, Christianity, any number of things. But, uh you know, it needs to be. A- Why does it have to be associated with any religion? I don't. I mean, I don't understand that. I, that's what I. I mean, that's what I don't. 
I don't really understand why it went from DMT the spirit molecule to DMT the soul prophecy and and suddenly I mean it seems like religion to me is is a very large problem here on this planet and I mean and suddenly you're it seems like Dr. Strassman, if I can be you know completely direct and honest and, and and radically kind of forward with you, is you you seem to go from you know this 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 open state where you were exploring to this structured state of okay, I'm going to connect this to Juda- Judaism. Why? Why did you Why did you decide to do that? Well, there's a couple of, of answers. I. Uh, or res- responses, I guess, too. Um, you know, in a way, I think I've expanded the conversation enormously, you know, rather than shrunk it. Um, my initial approach was the purely scientific model, the brain on drugs, or, you know, Freudian, you know, psychoanalytic psychology, the clinical research model. So by, you know, taking it out of those particular frameworks into the more spiritual, you know, it's called this, I mean, I coined the phrase spirit molecule. What, what does spirit actually mean? I mean, s- spirit can mean things which are, you know, normally invisible, but I think spirit or spiritual can also point to the highest uh, qualities of the human being the you know the highest concepts, the highest emotions, the highest uh, work, the highest prayer, all those things, you know. So, I think rather, well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, when my book first came out, the DMT book, actually, you know, in you know two thousand one, uh, you know, there was a you know book review in um, in a. Def, you know, in a you know now defunct magazine called Shaman's Drum, and uh, you know the reviewer you know said it shouldn't be called the spirit molecule; it should be called the dream molecule, um, which you know I kind of you know took umbrage with uh, because I felt it was more of a spiritual kind of experience, but. Um, I think, in you know, retrospect, you know, um, um, that the reviewer, you know, was onto something, uh, because I was still working within the brain-only model, uh, and even with my you know theory about uh, dark matter and parallel universes, it it was still sort of a, you know a you know bottom-up approach, like our brain changes and then is able to, you know, perceive things, and that's just, you know, how it is. You know, so I've, you know, taken it from a more bottom-up approach to a more, you know, top-down approach, that the spiritual, you know, world is real, and it influences us, and um, we can be more receptive to it uh, if our brain chemistry is changed, which then kind of takes you into the territory of, well, you know, how do you optimize that Um, um, as well as, uh, you know, trying to understand some, you know, mechanisms, you know, by which, um, uh, you know, by which, you know, that could happen. So the, you know, way of optimizing it is uh, by looking toward, you know, systems of thought which have also addressed spiritual questions, uh, you know, things which aren't, you know, um, w- w- which are not, you know, normally visible and which influence our everyday life uh, behind the scenes, as it were, you know, that we're able to make, you know, contact with every so often through um, the altered states, which are, uh, you know, made available, you know, to us through either drugs or prayer, you know, fasting, those kinds of things. Uh, you know, so I think it's, you know, um, when you were talking about religion being a problem, I think it's really important to distinguish between, you know, two different kinds of religion. You know, there's, you know, one religion <clears throat> or one, you know, definition of um, of religion, which Spinoza and I, you know, call you know, superstition, you know, the religion of the masses, which is what is imposed on the masses by the clerics, 
mm-hmm. who demand or you know who are interested in you know power and money, mm-hmm. and you know that is the more kind of you know superstitious religion, which uh, mostly has been created and is you know sustained um, as a means of you know political control. Um, you know the other religion though. Is you know is what Spinoza used to call you know the religion of the elite, um, and one comes to the religion of the elite or an adult religion or a mature religion, you know through the observation of nature, uh, through you know understanding and probing into the nature of reality, and then being uh, you know, being you know, puzzled by and looking you know for you know some answers to the questions that come as a result of a careful investigation of both you know nature which includes us our our mind and uh, and uh, our human relationships um and you know the um well the medievalists used to uh prescribe a you know course of study which was you know, necessary before one could actually begin to study religion. You know, things like first really being able to, you know, to master mathematics and grammar, you know, physics, natural science, astronomy, um, you know, philosophy, those kinds of things. You know, those were the, you know, requirements to be able to then begin uh, exploring, you know, the mysteries which would be, you know, revealed uh, you know, through religious and spiritual study, uh, and you know that clearly isn't the kind of religion that most people you know think of. But you know that's the kind of religion that uh, I think one ought to uh, you know consider um, when attempting to make you know sense of and integrate the you know full you know spectrum of the spiritual. Uh, you know, you know, perceptions and ideas which you know come to us as a result of a big, you know, psychedelic experience. Yeah, I understand. And you know, just just to to wrap that that segment up, I just I can't believe I'm doing this, but I'm going to just to quote Karl Marx: uh, "Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people." And that, that quote has floated around for a while. I mean, people call it the opiate of the masses, but I think I understand the difference of what you're saying. I think there's, and I agree, you know, and, and I've read Spinoza enough to know, you know, the difference between, okay, there's a religion that um, that is designed to to control and oppress human beings, to, to control them. It is the opiate of, of the masses, as Mr. Marx kind of tells us and then there's a there's another which i would i would regard as more esoteric as more occult more hidden and that is designed to kind of bring us into these spiritually aware states and that is designed to better our lives and in a way that we're not indoctrinated uh right and i think you know um when it comes to you know looking at spiritual you know tech texts um you know it isn't like you know they're a cookbook or uh, a john grisham novel you know they can take you know years uh to crack like you know for example you know the book of genesis which i've been you know reading real carefully um you know it took me like a year to read the book of genesis um and really understand what it was you know trying to say you know like it isn't that the universe was created in you know, a hundred and whatever, you know, 68 hours. Um, but that there were stages in the evolution of the universe from the Big Bang up to the present day, you know, seven stages. And, you know, that's a, you know, special number, special way of dividing, you know, things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so you really, you know, need a scorecard or a, a you know um, a you know, program uh, a number of programs to be able to uh, you know tell what is actually you know being described and I guess that's what you're talking about with the esoteric model um, you know that you really need to be able to you know dig below the surface 
of the text and the words to understand what's uh, what's you know being said. Yeah, certainly. And, and, you know, which is, you know, one of the you know points that I like to make in my new book, The Soul of Prophecy, is, you know, that, that, you know, the text, at least in the case of the Hebrew Bible, is a prophetic text, which was transmitted, received in a prophetic state of consciousness, which I think I, you know, demonstrate pretty convincingly, you know, shares a lot of, you know, features, you know, with uh, the DMT state. You know, so if that's the case, you know, then the closer that you are to being in a prophetic state, the more the text can, you know, resonate with your own mind and you can understand deeper layers. You know, so that's, you know, one of the, I'm sure, bound to be controversial, you know, suggestions that, you know, kind of grows out of my book is if if you are in a slightly altered state brought about by the you know, psychedelics which uh, overlaps or you know shares some you know features with the prophetic state you know then the text begins to make uh, you know more sense um, you know, than it normally would so dr Strassman, we're, well, I mean, so we're try p- it you know the next time go ahead well the next time you're drinking ayahuasca uh, and you get home and you're still kind of altered you know Open up your King James Bible and, you know, read the first couple of chapters of, you know, Genesis and, you know, see if it makes any more, uh, you know, sense than it, uh, you know, did before. I'll keep that in mind. I mean, um, Dr. Strassman, we're we're approaching, we're right at the end here. And, you know, I I just want to ask you this one last question. I, you're, you're what, you're 64, 65 years old now? Uh, 64. Okay. So, you're 64 years old. You, I think... I think your research has, is, I mean, you've defined your legacy. The DMT, the spirit molecule, is known by anyone who, who is studying these compounds. Is there, has there been any point in your career, in your life, and, and I'm, I'm sure you'll, you, know, you have a long life ahead of you, but I, I mean, is, is there anything that you kind of would go back and change, go back and alter? Go back and, you know, just just make different. Is there anything that you would tell your younger self while you were researching these compounds? Anything different? Well, man, I, I'll tell you. I think I, uh, I think I was always at the, you know, the edge uh, of my capacities. Um, yeah, you know, I was thinking. Well, you know, maybe I could have had more psychotherapy <laughs> and which would have helped me make some better decisions oh man which, that's know, hilarious which may have helped me make some you know better decisions about staff or about the exact grants that i wrote but uh you know i think i was operating on you know at you know maximal horsepower every cylinder has been firing pretty much for most of my life. I don't think I could have done anything different. You know, if I were a different person, let's say my parents were different or I grew up in a different place or uh, encountered different people in my life, then I may have done things differently. But, uh, at th- you know, it also may have been the case that I never got interested in this field. So I think all things take into, into account uh, – you know, I think I've really, I've, I've, you know, really optimized uh, my gifts and my good luck. Fair enough, sir. Fair enough. I appreciate the, appreciate the answer, uh, Doctor Strassman. Where can where can people find your work? Where can they get to your website? Yeah, uh, you know, if uh, anybody's interested in contacting me or buying books from me directly, which I'll inscribe and sign. Uh, they can get in contact with me, you know, see my public appearances, any planned events at Um Yeah, or you can just, uh, you know, Google my name and, uh, you know, my website comes up, uh, uh, you know, quite readily. 
Yeah. Okay. We'll definitely make that available for people. All right, guys. Um, this is another episode of the Human Experience. Thank you, guys, so much for listening, Doctor Strassman. Thank you so much for being here, sir. I really appreciate your work and your time. Uh, we will see you guys next week.